for this very special event. Um, as many of you can see by the lights and all that's around, we're also doing something uh, a little different now starting uh, this month. We've been live streaming uh, many of our events uh, from the bookshop. And uh, what that means is for all of you out there who are not here in the room, uh, you're, wa you're going to be able to watch from wherever you are. Uh, last time when we had John Dufresne, uh, I think we had people from as far away as, uh, as uh, Washington State and other places who were watching uh, live. So if you're not in Miami and you're not able to make one of our events, check our website to see if we're live streaming it possibly. And the other thing which makes it all doubly exciting is that once you've enjoyed tonight, you can go home and you can watch it <laughs> again <laughs> because we are archiving uh, these events as well. Uh, so uh, it never ends here at Books and Books. Um, the other thing I would like to tell you is that uh, in an effort to get uh, as many emails as we can so you can find out about, about what's happening here at the store, uh, we're going to ask you, if you would, to please, if you haven't already, sign up with your email address so we can send you uh, emails, um, more emails than you ever want to get in your life. But they're really great and they're really worth it. Uh, but we're going to send you emails. But to, to sweeten the deal a little bit, e this month, at the end of this month, we're going to do a random drawing and send one of you who are new to our email list a gift card from Books and Books uh, as a gift. And for those of you who are regular customers who have been, been with us and have signed up for the email before, uh, so you don't feel left out, we're going to do a drawing uh, from one of our regular customers as well so that we'll give out two gift cards uh, by the end of this month. So let me send this around. Uh, I believe there's a pen somewhere. Uh, we'll start right over here. The other thing, because we're live streaming, that's really important, is that when you ask a question, I'm going to walk around with a mic, that you ask it into the mic so everybody uh, at home can hear it as well. With that said, uh, again, I want to welcome you and I want to say how uh, happy we are that you've uh, chosen to come to Books and Books, uh, even though it's, uh, it's, believe it or not, we're in August. Uh, and to see so many of you out here is really heartening and speaks to Patricia and the excitement surrounding her new novel. For me personally, it's something you didn't know. <clears throat> we have an additional excitement tonight, and that is that introducing uh, Patricia is someone uh, whom I think you'll all know and uh, you will all be very excited about. And you'll be excited to learn that she has a new novel, which we will be celebrating the publication of here at Books and Books on Tuesday, August 27th as well. And that's Edvige Danticat is with us tonight. And her new book is called Claire of the Sea Light. And I can tell you, as I've already had a chance to read it, you guys are in for a great treat. Um, and you're in for a great treat anyway, because we have Edvige in the room tonight. So please give Edvige Danticat a big, big <laughs> round of applause. Bonsoir. Um, given the title and subject of the book, I'm tempted to do this in French. So <laughs> But I wrote something down so I can um, resist that temptation. You have come to not just a reading, but to a celebration. Today is the publication date, pub date, of Patricia Engel's It's Not Love, It's Just Paris. In non-book terms, it's like the day when your baby, or your friend's baby, emerges into the world after years of gestation, frustration, and occasional glimmers of joy. It's Not Love, It's Just Paris is a joy to read. It's a beautiful, funny, heartbreaking, and overall gorgeous novel. Plus, it's set in Paris, which is always a bonus. Though it's not the Paris you've always, you're always hearing about or have seen or read about before. We're lucky to live in a community that is filled with amazing talent, and Patricia is certainly one of them. Her first book, Vida, a collection of short stories, was a revelation to me and to many others. 
Michiko Kakutani of the New York Times said it was striking, compelling, like snapshots from someone's photo album with unsparing psychological precision. Vanity Fair said it was arresting and vibrant. And our own Miami Herald said it was a mesmerizing debut. Now, it's not Love, It's Just Paris. It's technically a day old today. So it doesn't have any awards or uh, like Vida yet, but it will. It's been on dozens of must-read lists for the summer, and the early reviews have already been glowing. Booklist called it remarkable, razor sharp, and compa compassionate read. The Tampa Bay Times said it was unpredictable and touching. And this past Sunday in the Miami Herald, Amy Driscoll said it was a story to get lost in, in a good way. But as Marissa Atkinson of the blog Book Riot says, the number one reason you need to read this novel is to experience Patricia's writing. Wry, melancholy, enchanting, seductive, and downright delectable. I agree with all this and more. I feel like I fell in love in this book and with this book. You know in Casablanca, when Humphrey Bogart tells Ingrid Bergman, we'll always have Paris. Well now, we'll always have that Paris, but we'll also have Patricia's Paris. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est un très grand, très grand plaisir pour moi de vous présenter Patricia Engel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of our own, Patricia Engel. Wow. Well, let me gather myself. <laughs> Just so you know, it really is a hero of mine. So to be here and have her introduce me is... <laughs> so before, before I get started, first I want to thank all of you for coming out here on an August, a steamy August night, um, and just for showing up for this. It's, um, I see a lot of familiar faces, but a lot of unfamiliar faces, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, so in addition to thanking Edwige for her support and her kindness, and believe me, she's as kind as she is talented, I want to give a special thanks to Mitchell Kaplan, who's, who ha has seen me sort of roam around here for the past 10 years. <laughs> and um, I, I moved to uh, Miami a little over nine years ago to pursue my master's degree in creative writing at FIU. And so the university program had some events here, and that's how I got to know books and books. And then I would come and spend time here browsing and buying books and um, just hanging around books and, you know, meeting friends for lunch or for coffee. But um, the most important thing is that I don't know if you all know that there are writers here every night of the week, um, sometimes more than one giving readings. And for me, at that time when I came here, I hadn't really seen writers in real life. So um, I want to say that I, I, think, I feel like I got a second master's degree here <laughs> in books and books for all the readings that I came here for, and then to see writers in person and be able to listen to them read their work and ask them questions and have them answer you. Um, it's, um, it's really, really special, and of course, that can only exist in a place like this. And of course, that's something that you will never get when you buy a, a discounted book online. <laughs> <laughs> <It's so laughs> so, uh, so bookstores are important, not just for the readers, but, um, but also for those who will become writers. And so I want to thank Mitchell and, of course, the staff that I've come to know over the years who are, are really wonderful people. So thank you all. <laughs> Is the mic okay? I feel like I should take off my shoes, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is, this is the book. This is what I've been working on the past few years since my last book, and people say, what about the novel? Well, here it is. <laughs> so um, it's called It's Not Love, It's Just Paris. It's about love, and it takes place in Paris. <laughs> so I'm going to read to you um, from the beginning, so you get a feel of kind of where it goes. 
um, starts with uh, with Lila, uh, the narrator, and she's a, a Colombian American girl from New Jersey who's off to Paris, which she will tell you about. And then, um, and then maybe I'll read a little bit from further on in the book, and you can see where the book goes. Okay, so here we go. The first person to call it the House of Stars was Seraphine's husband, Theophile, a drunk who often passed out in the entrance court before making it to the front door. He'd say that from his cheek to the cobblestone view, all he saw were faint lights like stars in the bedroom windows, and no matter the hour, there were always stars out on our stretch of Rue du Bac, which is also how Seraphine's place got a reputation, among others, for being a house that never sleeps. I just met her when she told me Theo carried on an affair with her sister, Charlotte, the whole time they were married, but he'd chosen Seraphine for his wife because she was the one who inherited the Delaroque fortune. Everyone knew Theo and Char about Theo and Charlotte's romance, but back then people were more strategic in their marrying. It was the fashion, Seraphine said, and believe me, a lot of things you'd never expect were the fashion. Soon after my arrival, I asked what happened to Theophile because I hadn't yet met him, but always saw his hat resting on the chest in the front foyer as if he were lost somewhere in the house. Seraphine rearranged herself among her bed pillows and lit a cigarette before sighing. Matteo suicided himself 17 years ago. The writer who lived across the way had done the same a month before. It was the fashion. Seraphine was a countess. Around the house and even around Paris, people ke still kept track of that stuff, even though titles went out with the revolution. I was told by the guy who recommended me as a tenant that I should address her as Madame la Comtesse or just plain Countess if I planned on sticking to English. But I couldn't utter either without feeling I was part of a performance. So within hours of my arrival, I asked if I could call her by her first name instead. Her coal-lined eyes expanded to reveal their inner pink membranes, and she took a while to respond. I was thinking this sort of friendliness might have been a grave mistake and wondered if there was a way to reverse it when Seraphine finally cleared her throat and smiled with what, using her frown lines as evidence, I took to be her first in years. Very well, Leticia. You may call me Seraphine if you insist. Soon all the girls started calling her Seraphine too, even those who'd been residents for years already and had addressed her formally. Her grandson, Loic, tried to rectify my disgrace, saying it was rude of us to be so familiar, and we should at least address her as Madame, since we were all guests in Seraphine's house, which wasn't really true, given that we all paid good money to live there, in American dollars, no less, a year's rent in full up front. But it was too late. The order of the house had already shifted. Princess Diana had died while I was on the night flight from Newark to Paris. The taxi driver tossed Le Figaro with the headline and picture of the tunnel crash across my lap and drove me from Charles de Gaulle over to the 7th. I remembered watching her wedding on television with my mother when I was a kid, and it didn't feel like so long ago, but now that was just a story people would tell, and instead of happily ever after, it would be, and the princess and her lover died in Paris together, the end. The news of her death made me feel old and brought on a sharp longing for my mother, who turned her back from me at the airport so that I wouldn't see the shine of her tears. The taxi driver let me keep the newspaper. He'd bought multiple copies, he said, figuring they'd be worth something, because it's not every day that a princess dies. I tucked it into the back of my jeans and dragged my two suitcases off the sidewalk, across the courtyard, to the countess's house and into the foyer. Nobody turned up when I rang the bell. Like Seraphine, the house of stars must have been very beautiful once. You could see the allure and majesty under the costume of Persian rugs, marble floors, molded ceilings, enormous chandeliers and gilded mirrors. But if you looked closer, you'd see the rugs were darkened with age, spotted with cigarette stains, worn with high heel holes. The marble floor chipped in decades overdue for polishing, the moldings cracked with cherubs missing heads or wings. The mirrors were fogged over, their frames tarnished, the chandeliers missing crystals and bulbs. Then there were the decorative details, wooden furniture with mother of pearl and enamel inlays that were Louis something or other, chest and tiny tables holding figurines and miniature silver boxes, the sordid stuff that you'd see at any given garage sale back home.
and that bouquet of old tobacco, lingering despite all those little glass bowls of lavender potpourri. A voice called, and I followed it down the short hall off the foyer, and then I saw her, seraphine, propped up by a mound of white cushions and a large mahogany sleigh bed, floating at the center of the room, over a floor layered with carpets. Lace curtains shouted glass doors that opened onto the back garden. She was dressed in a white bedgown, her legs covered by an airy duvet, looking porcelain with what was left of her long, colorless hair swiped into a tight bun. Pearls dropped off her ears, her thin lips were covered in a runny red pigment, and her eyes were lined with a dark gunk that, I can, that was her trademark and probably the reason for her cataracts. Even in bed, fat like a panda, she was an elegant sort of lady, just like the younger Seraphine staring back at her from the framed photographs that lined the yellowed walls, and I often wondered what her husband didn't see in her. By then, Seraphine was almost 90 and hadn't left her room in three years, a vestige that came with the house. The maids called her the Maharani because doctors, friends, and the bits of the world that married to Seraphine came to her when summoned. They said she would have to be bulldozed out if any of her descendants were to have their way and try to sell the house, as I soon learned that her own daughter was hoping to do. When I asked Seraphine why she decided to rent out rooms in her house, she explained that before it was the house of stars, it was the house of felines. Theo, who was the obsessive type, had collected his way up to 50 or so of some rare breed of Siamese, and each room, which now boarded a girl, once housed five or six cats, plus a few favorites who had free reign of the estate. Theo treated the cats like curios, and spent his day visiting each of them, brushing them and clipping their nails, whispering in Russian, because Theo was Russian in a former life, rumored to be Jewish. And though it was never mentioned, because the Delaroque family wanted people to think that they were thoroughly French and Catholic, throwing around that old proverb that a good name is worth more than a golden belt. The maid said that was also the reason Seraphine never took Theo's giveaway of a last name, and why he was so taken with the writer across the street, who was also Russian and Jewish in some capacity. One day, Seraphine got fed up with the cats. She said she couldn't do anything about Theophile sleeping with her sister like it was his God-given right, but she could evict the cats because it was her house, inherited from her father who favored her as his firstborn. She'd wanted to pack up the cats and send them to live with the prostitutes and bums in the Bois de Bologna, but those cats were each worth a small bundle, so she found herself a cat broker and sold him the lot for a lump sum. <laughs> He came to collect them with a van full of cages one evening while Theo was out drinking. When he sobered up the next day and saw the cats were gone, Theo had a breakdown and Seraphine was certain he never really forgave her. It was Theophile's idea to fill the rooms with girls now that the cats were gone. They started out with two, then three, and worked their way up to eight. She said Theo found keeping young girls just as amusing as keeping cats. The maids murmured that for all their blue blood and this property, the Delaroque family was broke and the countess discovered an easy income in housing allegedly well-bred debutante boarders and plenty of parents eager to pay a one-time noblewoman to supervise their daughters on séjour. I was the only new girl that season. There was a long waiting list to live in the house, and a girl was considered only if personally recommended as I was by a former professor who was tenuously related to Théophile. Each girl was given her own private room on the second and third floors, while Seraphine lived downstairs. Her grandsons, Loke and Gaspard, the sons of her only daughter, had an apartment in the smaller west wing of the house, accessed through a separate entrance or through a narrow hideaway passage under, under the stairs left over from the war. Seraphine assigned me to the bedroom above hers at the top of the staircase. Even though there were three maids, Portuguese sisters, wh whose mother was the rarely seen concierge, living in a little apartment just inside the entrance court, and Noah and Gaspard were supposed to be the house managers, I'd arrived when everybody was taking their lunch. Thus, no one came along to help me drag my bags upstairs or to show me where things were, like the kitchen or the common phone, which only received incoming calls, or to tell me the toilet was on one end of the hall while the tiled washroom with a curtainless bath was down the other end.
I'd opened the balcony doors to clear out the stale air and was kneeling on my bedroom floor pulling clothes from a suitcase when I noticed twin pairs of sandals in the doorway belonging to two girls staring down at me as if I were a raccoon rummaging through a trash pile. I don't have sisters, just two brothers, one older and one younger. I hadn't had many girlfriends in school and felt uh, that I knew my way around books better than people. I was 20 years old, graduated from a top university with honors, two years ahead of schedule in life, but still a social novice. And these girls, Tarantina and Jada, as they introduced themselves, came off as a fearsome twosome. Their dirty blonde hair and tangled bobs, black bras peeking from the tops of their nearly identical knee-grazing floral dresses, and similar firm round breasts that Loic later told me they'd purchased together during last year's <laughs> Easter holiday in Tarantina's hometown of Rio. It was the fashion. <laughs> Jada, slightly shorter, leaned on the door frame, her lips in a permanent pout, while her girlfriend asked who I was and where I came from with a quasi-British twang I'd learned was standard among the Swiss boarding school set. I told them my name was Leticia, but I went by Lita and I was American, and by their faces I could tell they did not believe me. What are your last names, Tarantina asked. Del Cielo, it's the only one I've got. She smiled, though not warmly. That sounds like a stage name. What's your blood? <laughs> My blood? Your lineage, she sighed, already born with me. Your country, you know, what are you made of? Colombian. Indian, I presume, she turned to Jada. That explains the jungle face. <laughs> in fact, I was named for a jungle city in the Amazon on the shared frontiers of Colombia, Brazil, and Peru. I didn't come out of the jungle, but my mother did, found abandoned on a road and turned over to some nuns who took her back to the capital. Back then, indigenous babies were nearly unadoptable, and instead of turning her over to an orphanage, the nuns raised my mother in the convent. I didn't feel like explaining any of that, so all I said was, I guess it does. Well, Loic asked me to tell you that he's on his way. He usually does the welcoming. We'll chat more once you settle in. They departed with a chow chow, their sandals flapping down the stairs over their soft laughter until they were out the front door. Dread spread over me. I'd hoped to live on my own in Paris, scouring classifieds in a second-hand Fusac, circling affordable studio apartment listings. But my father had insisted he'd only let me live abroad if I had company, a respectable witness to my existence. The House of Stars was the compromise I was beginning to regret. A short while later, Loic, gangly in his gingham shirt, pressed trousers and prematurely wrinkle-faced, tapped on my door and introduced himself. So sorry not to have been here when you arrived. I had an emergency of sorts. Well, a friend had an emergency. I stood up to greet him, shaking his bony hand. Have you had a look around the house yet? Yes, it's nice. I met your grandmother and some of the other girls, Jada and Tarantina, he finished. He stared at me, his eyes a watery blue. The first day is always the hardest, he said. I forced a smile. I'm just tired from the travel, the time change. Why don't you take a break from your unpacking and join me outside for some fresh air? <coughs> he held out his hand as if luring me off a ledge. Loic's idea of fresh air was a cigarette. We sat on the front steps of the house, his knobby knee gliding against the blue jeans I'd pulled on the day before back in New Jersey as my father shouted from downstairs that if I didn't hurry, I'd miss my flight. Loic offered me a lucky strike from his pack. I wasn't a smoker, but I'd smoked plenty with Ajax, my childhood best friend who was a real fiend, especially when he was coming off drugs. I might never have come to Paris if not for Ajax, whose real name was Andrew Jackson, just like the president. We were early nerds together, thrown together in the exile of the gifted classes and Saturday enrichment programs at the local college. He was traumatized into being an achiever since he found out that his father, whom he thought was dead, was actually a dentist with another family across town. We went to the same school as his half-siblings, and Ajax decided to excel in class to make them look like the losers. <laughs> Ajax and his mother lived in a tiny apartment above the liquor store, and my family lived in a professionally decorated mansion, but he still thought we were minority trash because his mother raised him on the myth that they were the long-lost cousins of the Kennedys. <laughs> his mother left him alone a lot, and afternoons, when we were meant to be studying in the library, we'd hide out in his room watching skateboarding videos and planning our destiny as super cool adults. 
Neither of us really fit into our whitewashed town of monograms and country club memberships, but I didn't mind much because Ajax always said, the community is just conformity with a rose behind its ear. He was currently in jail for trying to kill his mother. <laughs> I'd never visited him, but I once sent him a box of books he lent me over the years. Most of them were stolen from the library or local bookstore anyway. They were sexy books, books about Europe and elsewhere, people living unchartered lives, the kind of people we both wanted to be after high school. Then Ajax said we'd really start living. But the box of books was returned to me, so I took it to the apartment, hoping to leave it with his mother, but she'd moved, and when I asked down at the liquor store, nobody had knew, knew where she'd gone. Maybe it was the rotated yellowing teeth, the hollowed cheeks, stork-thin arms, or the way Loic held his cigarette between his middle and ring finger. But my memories of Ajax built an instant bridge of familiarity between us. Maybe it was his eyes, pale and beckoning. Maybe it's just that lonely attracts lonely. Loic was the kind of guy who'd drive down Avenue Foch in his mini and pick up a young hooker, only to give her free money and offer to help her find a decent job somewhere. He really did that, about once a week, but I was the only one who knew, because I've always been the sort of person people find it easy to tell their secrets to. The truth is I'm very quiet out loud, shy like an escargot, saving my chatter for the privacy of my own mind, and I'm only talky like this when I'm still trying to understand what things mean to me. I took the cigarette Loic offered me that afternoon, thinking it was a good way to christen this new life. Loic didn't say much, not even when I broke into a coughing fit after my first drag. He looked over his sharp shoulder and then through his smoky smile, as if he could read my weariness and fears, said, don't worry, Lita, you're going to be very happy here, I promise. Thanks. So uh, I'm just going to read a little piece from, you know, further into the book. So here, um, Lita is out with uh, one of her housemates, Maribel, who's a girl from Spain who's, who's in Paris to study art at L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And she comes from a, a prominent artistic family. She's the daughter of artists herself. And uh, she's having an affair with uh, one of her professors. His name is Florian, and he's married. <laughs> okay. So, Maribel was often depressed due to Florian's unwillingness to leave Elisa. She'd spend a string of nights at the studio, followed by a week as a bed-bound slug, with Florent Pagny's Savoir Aimé playing on repeat in her CD player, until Florian appeared at the House of Stars, pleading through her closed door, and she'd finally let him in. I'd hear them through the thin wall that separated our bedrooms, the sound of weight shifting on her metal bed frame, the headboard slamming against the plaster wall, the sounds of promises, his telling her he loved her and her inevitable, desperate questioning growing louder and louder, then why won't you leave her? <laughs> that week, he had a new policy of non-response. Tarantina, <laughs> you, you know what that means. <laughs> Tarantina said it was meant to keep her hopeful, and hope needs very little fuel. She called Maribel an idiot for making demands. She said only the stupidest women think an affair can exist anywhere outside the bedroom. She had been with the musician for years already, and his wife had yet to catch on. He wasn't the only married man on her roster, but Tarantina was as discreet as a tomb, and her men knew this, which always kept them coming back. Maribel took medication for her frequent spiraling emotional states per, and, per her doctor's recommendation, long walks through the Latin Quarter that were meant to clear her mind. Lately, I was the only one willing to join her. We went to go browse the stalls of the Bouquinist, and when Maribel checked out the book bins looking for interesting cover artwork, I eavesdropped on a, on a brown-bearded American expat in a Navy fisherman's sweater at the next stall over as he told a pair of Mexican backpackers in French spattered English how he'd come to Paris 25 years early as a philosophy student but had fallen in love with both a woman and the city and never returned home. Now he operated a stall selling Belle Epoque postcards and painting reproductions but he was really a raconteur he said, a storyteller, a lover of words and the language of the soul. 
I thought of my father. Once before my graduation, I'd mentioned the possibility of changing direction and not studying diplomacy as I'd been planning. Papi thought I meant I'd join him and Santi at the family business, but when I saw that I was considering something more creative, he shook his head and as, if I, as if I'd been terribly mistaken and said there was no need for that. I was already an artist by blood. All immigrants are artists because they create a life, a future, from nothing but a dream. The immigrant's life is, in, is art in its purest form. That's why God has special sympathy for immigrants, because Diosito was the first artist in Jesus, un pobre desplazado. It's not the same, Papi, I tried, but he shook his head. But of course it is, mijita. All your life is a work of art. A painting is not a painting, but the way you live each day. A song is not a song, but the words you share with the people you love. A book is not a book, but the choices you make every day trying to be a decent person. When we were on our way again, Maribel looked to the American inside. A thousand idiots come to Paris every day, thinking they're artists, but hardly any of them really have it in them. Look at me. I was born and bred for this shit, and I don't even have it in me. Come on, Maribel, everybody knows you're talented, I said. And it was true, but everyone also knew that Maribel was a third generation painter of commercially viable lineage and had a greater chance of making money from it than the majority of her peers. Basta, Lira, I know what I am. I'm a great imitator. I'm learned, not original, but people can't tell the difference. She talked as we crossed through Saint-Germain and seared through cigarette after cigarette, rambling that she wanted to disappear, dissolve into the earth like spit. By the time we reached Rue du Cherche Midi, she'd worked herself into a disquieted frenzy, stopping along the wall of a building to gather forces for the rest of the walk home. A green BMW pulled up along the curb in front of us. Its windows rolled down, and a man in one of those a man in one of those checked shirts with the initials sewn on the pockets that Loic owned by the dozen leaned across the passenger seat and waved us over. I thought he was asking for directions, so I stepped forward. I'm looking for something tropical, he said. I assumed Tropical was the name of a bar or restaurant in the area <laughs> and said I hadn't heard of it, but he laughed and pointed to Maribel on the wall behind me. How much for both of you? He could have been a father, a doctor, or an executive with his suit jacket neatly folded across the passenger seat. According to that gold wedding band twinkling in the window frame, he was also a husband. How much? He rubbed his fingers together to make sure that I understood he meant money. I walked over to the car, slow, slinky, the way I imagined the Avenue Foch girls did when getting ready to climb into a car. I bent down to the window, smiling a smile that did not belong to me, but to some other girl with solid gold cojones. <laughs> that depends on what you want. How much for the ass he was practically salivating. I took a drag on my cigarette and turned my hips toward him. This ass? He nodded, showing me a wide, symmetrical smile that must have cost a fortune. <laughs> I leaned into the window. This ass will cost you extra. I grabbed his wrist and pressed it firmly on the window frame with one hand, using my free hand to rub my cigarette into the top of his palm while he squealed in pain, trying to pull back his hand, but I was overcome with strength and held on tightly, singeing his pink skin with my cigarette. He called me putain, salaud, petas, conas, and many other words I didn't know while I let him burn. Maribel finally grabbed my arm and we ran from the top of Cherchemidi across the intersection down Rue du Bac before the gendarmes at the Varenne Post stopped us, demanding to know why two girls were running in a neighborhood not known for velocity. <laughs> we're just going home, I told them. We were but a few meters from our green doors. What's that accent? asked the second gendarme. I could tell he was the one in charge. There's always one in charge. It's not any kind of accent. It's the way I talk. Why were you running? I looked at Maribel, breathless and not much help, and neither of us felt there was any point in telling them the truth. We're just going home, I pointed down the road. We live in the House of Stars. Show me your papers. We just stepped out for some air, I started, ready to negotiate, but he shook his head and held his finger in the air as if determining the wind. Your papers, now. 
I'd been warned that I should carry my documentation, though everyone in the neighborhood knew about Seraphine's place and that it was full of girls from all over. But we both had only bank and metro cards on us, which didn't prove our legitimacy enough. So they fined us 500 francs each in cash, which they told us we could withdraw from the bank machine around the corner. <laughs> How convenient for you, I told the officer who followed to make sure we didn't make a run for it. You should thank me for not arresting you. Foreigners should have their papers on them at all times. After we handed over the bills, the boss here, gendarme, said, if it's true you live in the House of Stars, I want to see you walk into it. They followed us as we made our way to our address, muttering about our cools, and observed as I typed the security passcode into the keypad and pushed open the door to the entrance court. They watched from the sidewalk as we crossed the courtyard, and I produced a key and opened our way into the house. As we stepped into the foyer, we turned to face the guards and flipped them off. <laughs> I with the American middle finger, and Maribel, Spanish style, with two fingers in the back of the hand. <laughs> the gendarmes responded by sticking out their tongues and grabbing their crotches, thrusting in our direction. All of which, I'm sure you know, translates directly. <laughs> Thank you for listening. If anyone has questions, please just raise your hand and yes. I heard you on NPR this morning, and I wondered, uh, you said that you'd been to Paris many times. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Were you a student, or what, what took you there and kept you there? OK. Um, yeah, so I, I spent a good amount of time in Paris as a, a teenager. And then when I was in college, I, I lived there and studied there for a year in the house of the Countess. <laughs> Although it's not autobiographical, <laughs> but you know, not everybody lives in the house of a countess, so I had to write a book about it. Um, and then I spent a lot of time there in the, in the years since, some extended periods as well. So it's a, a city that I love very much, and it's kind of my love letter to Paris, writing this book. Did you make friends with people? Well, your native language is Spanish. Um, it's English. English, great. <laughs> uh, it's easier uh, for me. Uh, did, did you make friends with people there who were not English speakers and learn their languages in a mm -hmm. basic way? Um, yeah, well, I grew up speaking both Spanish, and probably Spanish is my first language, but I learned it simultaneously <laughs> with English. Um, but um, in real life, uh, the house, in, in this novel, there's eight girls in the house. In the real house that I lived in, there were 14 of us. Um, so they came from all over the world. Most spoke sp English to some degree. Um, a few did not, but they spoke, they were there to study French or knew enough French. So there was communication in either French or Spanish or English or whatever, <laughs> you know. But um, that was kind of the charm of it as well. And that, that, that element um, is in the book. I went when I was nicely over 50. <laughs> and, uh, but the kids seemed to tolerate me. I was in a small hotel mm -hmm. on the Boulevard Rest by, and I, I would not take anything. I went four summers. It was wonderful. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Paris is the kind of place that everybody has their own relationship with, which is what makes it so special. Hi. What are some of the challenges of transitioning from short stories to actually writing a, like a, a novel. not actually writing a novel because that makes it seem like it's you know yeah. a higher <laughs> form but it's not um but yeah some of the differences between writing um well the she has some of the differences between uh, writing short stories and a novel obviously novel is a, a longer more sustained form so it really comes down to stamina a lot <coughs> of the time um 
and you know stories even if they're part of a collection or then build a larger work you can step away from them a bit whereas writing a novel I can only talk about my own personal take on it which is I have this terrible fear of it like slipping out of my fingers so I'm just totally obsessed with it until it's done and because it's much longer it kind of hijacks your life and not in a good way <laughs> And um, and it's and it's it really just comes down to, to stamina, you know. There's many times when you want to quit and give up and do something else, but if you don't, it'll never go anywhere. So you got to stick with it. Are you getting your books translated into Spanish or French, other languages? Uh, my first book, yes, uh, about translations for my books. My first book, um, Vita, was, was uh, published in France as well and had a nice response there, which was nice. Um, the Spanish translation, I hope, is in the works. And um, this one, uh, the Spanish translation, is already in the works. Because I have, uh, uh, I we would like to buy your books in Spanish as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Do you think that we may hear more from Sabina, the protagonist of Vida? Oh, it's funny you should ask. Um, my, my secret dream, which won't be much of a secret now, is to write a sequel um, of, about Sabina's life as she went on. I always imagined her just continuing on her way, so, um, so that's, that's something I do hope to return to, but, but I haven't started yet. So. <laughs> When you are writing, how do you relate to the characters? Sorry? How do you relate to them, to How your characters? We well, um, it kind of starts with an emotional baseline, you know. I, I try to really start from a point of emotion and, and try to understand what my characters are, are yearning for. And, um, and then it's kind of the, the biography, the profile of their life just sort, sort, sort of comes together af after that. I think the easiest way to relate to them myself and, and find the, the road from between my life and theirs is, is emotionally. If not, I just would like to thank Patricia so uh, for such a remarkable <laughs> evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and also, whether she knows it or not, uh, we at Books and Books ha did recognize her all those years. <laughs> uh, it's hard not to recognize someone with such talent <laughs> as she has. Thank and so. Um, we want to then tell all of you that if you would like to, uh, if you were moved as I was, and you'd like to buy one of Patricia's books, they're available at the front desk, and Patricia will be signing on the other side uh, of the store as well. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank and if you, you on, uh, on, in TV land or in computer land <laughs> would like a copy of the book as well, you can just call into the store, and we'll make sure that you get a signed copy as well. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you.